giving the information to your family. So that way your family knows how to do what it is that you know, because it is not intuitive. Um, your family needs to know everything. More than one person needs to know it. Don't be scared about the fact that it's going to get stolen because you um, you need to make sure that it's accessible. Um, and at the you need to have them practice it. Welcome to another episode of Live with Bitcoin, where we delve into the human side of Bitcoin by focusing on Bitcoiners' personal transformations and their life stories. I'm your host, Vivian Chang. Thanks for tuning in. Today, the guest will be joining us is Jacqueline Cooper, aka Crypto Mom 2, is a law professional and the author of the Bitcoin Cinderella Blockchain Adventure series. She's also the one behind the Blockchain Legal Institute, a centralized repository of our decentralized age. Jackie, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I always love speaking with you, and this is going to be a lot of fun. Let's uh, dive deep into your personal Bitcoin story. What was the circumstances of for you? to discover Bitcoin. Tell us what happened. I actually started with an altcoin, but I'm really glad that I did because that made me really appreciate Bitcoin when I um, was introduced to it. Um, the altcoin had an ecosystem and that helped me understand that um, currencies could be all shapes and sizes, but it also gave me an understanding about the risks involved when you're dealing with a token that's not Bitcoin. So um, when I finally was introduced to Bitcoin and started to um, invest in it, I realized the brilliant concept of what it is in terms of being a peer-to-peer -peer type of support for um, those that are all around the world. And also the fact that it wasn't connected with any one company. You know, it's really individuals. Um, and I became a Bitcoin miner. I also have a node. I am also not nodeless. I mean, again, I'm experimenting in so many ways within the Bitcoin community because I love I love what it's all about and the philosophy behind it. I see. And what do you see the biggest differences between altcoin and Bitcoin? It's not so much the philosophy because I think that a lot of the altcoins do believe in being decentralized, but they might not be totally true to the concept of being decentral because of the fact that um, they're created by a central organization or company. So they might have the intent to, to um, have it be um, owned by many people, so decentral from that perspective. But when you think about how Bitcoin is created and the fact that you have um, mining rigs all around the world who are creating the coins and then you have individuals which is not company based that truly is the decentral decentralized community um and the other thing is that there can be yes there could be a hack of a wallet but there cannot really be a rug pull of bitcoin <laughs> unlike with unlike with a token um you know if you put a token onto a an exchange, and then the um, company's owners maybe don't have the liquidity that they need. The individuals who buy the token could get rug pulled, you know, if the um, owners end up taking the, the funds from that. So, um, so there's, I think, a higher level of risk involved with um, tokens. And there has to be, um, you know, much more understanding about the difference between Bitcoin, which can't be rug pulled, because again, it's created in such a way that no one owns it, uh, one no one entity owns it. Um, so you know, it's just it's it really the whole concept of peer to peer is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I see. And what were you originally doing with altcoins? Learning about the altcoins it helped me understand and appreciate more about the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important to explore every product so you can say that's right for me or that's not right for me. But you really can't make that choice and that decision unless you've educated yourself about different things. And I know as a as a teacher um, or as a woman, um, when I first started teaching, 
people would come into my school and say, okay, you should invest in a 501, you know, 401k or, you know, all these other products. And I just said, okay, you know, the mutual fund, fine, you know, but I never really took the time to learn about it. And, you know, later I was thinking to myself, I gave my financial control, my power to someone else. I need to take that back. I need to learn from me. So if they make the wrong decision, I can't Mm -hmm. say it was on them. Really, it was on me um, because I didn't take the time to learn. You're a law professional. And what are some illegal matters that Bitcoiner Bitcoiners should know and consider when they interact with Bitcoin. I think this is like a under discussed topic and it's all fun and nice to sack sats. But when it comes to, let's face it, like very little, very few people want to deal with legal issues themselves. And that's why they seek help from lawyers. But as Bitcoiners and then us solvent individuals, how do we approach Bitcoin from a legal perspective? The very first thing that um, I also kind of chatted with my daughter about um, is everyone in our community should have a will. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have any digital assets, you need a will and you need to um, have someone that you trust know where or how to access your seed words and that type of thing. Cold wallet, doesn't matter. Um, Because again, if you're building generational wealth on the blockchain and you don't share with someone in your family, what you're doing, and something happens to you, then that will stay there. And the people who you are trying to gift to, um, whether it's a charity or whether it's your family, um, they won't know. And it will just keep keep staying, keep growing, and it'll be part of the lost community, you know, <laughs> those, those computers that have been lost, you know, with all the wallets. Um, so that's the first thing that I would say, you know, that is something that is legal, but most people don't think about that. Um, the, the second thing that, you know, I would share with individuals are there's, there's two types of, of individuals within our community. There are individuals who are investing and then their businesses who are building, you know, mm-hmm. with Bitcoin. So depending upon what category you fall in, then there's going to be different legal considerations. So if you're an individual who's investing and you keep the Bitcoin on an exchange or like I did even with um, Bitcoin mining wallet and you don't own, you haven't moved your Bitcoin to something that you actually control then you have the chance that that Bitcoin could be lost. Um, so, you know, again, I have personal experience with that. Um, and so it, it taught me really in an eyes wide open way that simply trusting that someone else's um, platform is going to be there as a savings bank is not true. You always need to own your own coins. So that is something that as an individual, you need to be thinking about. And it's always scary when you move things because you never know, you know, you're always thinking it's, oh, is it going to mm-hmm. come? But it's very fast. I mean, like I have a nodeless wallet right now where I'm accepting Bitcoin for the um, giving away of my Bitcoin Cinderella books. And the founder of um, the nodeless wallet, he sent me sats. And it happened like instantaneously. And it was, you know, very, you know, it was, it was very cool. But um, again, so from, from the individual side, you need to be thinking about how do you own everything. Um, and then, you know, again, tied to the fact that um, where are you making sure your family knows about it. On the business side, there are a lot of different point of sale type of systems that allow you to um accept Bitcoin. And you need to do the research as to who they are and how is the, how's the Bitcoin getting back to you. And then again, same process of making sure you own it. Um, And again, different countries have different rules. So there are going to be laws that you have to look at from that perspective, depending upon where you are. Um, Those rules will also include taxes, you know, um, again, um, you know, here in the States, you know, there's different definitions and you have to, um, you know, 
think about how are you declaring it or not declaring it, what's considered a sale, what's, you know, all that. That's why you need to have the professionals that um, can advise you, whether it's accountants or lawyers or, you know, investment advisors. Now with Bitcoin, you can do an IRA with it. You know, there's um, different financial products that you can do. So, um, so from there's various levels of legal issues or topics that kind of overlay the surface um, of what Bitcoin is. So, um, you know, it's legislation and policy, you know, that that's there. And uh, the other, the other legal area that I would always, I always ask everyone is that if you're in this digital community, vote, let people know that, you know, your, what your view is, because the individuals who are making the policies need to know, because again, um, they can't necessarily stop Bitcoin because Bitcoin is not like an altcoin. They could stop XRP. They can't really stop Bitcoin from being mined and things like that. They might try to make it more difficult, but, you know, again, it's really important that we as a community be politically active so we can help ourselves and help others in our community. Because again, there are, there's a lot of good that's happening within our community. So would you say you're a single issue voter? If they're for um, Bitcoin, then I will vote for them. No, because I'm also a feminist. So <laughs> I have to balance off. I, you know, I, I remember this, maybe not during my personal time, but in, you know, at college, I, I, you know, studied um, the, the history of feminism and, um, which also just involves civil rights, you know, so I really, I do think Bitcoin is really a very important topic, but, um, I also believe that civil rights is equally important. And so I'm never going to be a single voter, a single topic voter, because I think that there has to be a balance. And, um, there are some topics that are equal in my heart. A lot of people are in Bitcoin to accumulate generational wealth. And from a lawyer's perspective, what is the best practice of passing it down to your kids um, and family members? Definitely, you need to have a will. You can also look at a trust. However, you don't need to go that route if you don't want to invest in the money to create a trust. Um, really, um, it will depend upon uh, you're deciding to create a trust it might depend upon how what your other assets are um but at the very least um you need to sit down with your family show them how to open up the cold wallet if you don't have one get one there's a variety of cold wallets that you can actually that's my dog so we're going to call her um uh, but she she agrees with me you definitely have to kind of look at um what's going on with um giving the information to your family. So that way your family knows how to do what it is that you know, because it is not intuitive and it is not easy if you haven't done it in a while to open up your wallet, what, you know, to go through your authenticator app or however you're doing it, there's a number of steps. And so you need to write that down. Um, I do have on Amazon a wallet organizer book as well, but I did that for my daughter um, because I realized that I have a variety of wallets and those wallets sometimes are on the phone, sometimes on the computer, sometimes you are get codes on your phone, sometimes you get it through an email. So depending upon you know where your Bitcoin wallet is and how you're storing your Bitcoin, um, your family needs to know everything. More than one person needs to know it. Don't be scared about the fact that it's going to get stolen because you um, you need to make sure that it's accessible. Um, and at the you need to have them practice it because it's like riding a bike. If you don't practice it, you won't know how to do it. And you think in theory, oh, yeah, I can do this. But no, when you start to actually take the time to do a download or to open up something, you have to think, oh, wait a minute, I have to do this, you know, so have them practice. You're going to be right there with them. You're not going to lose anything. <laughs> is your, your kid Bitcoiner yet? My daughter uh, is not a Bitcoiner that I know of, 
but that doesn't mean that maybe she's not investing and she just hasn't told me. So um, great, great question. I know she's visiting this weekend. I'm going to ask her, <laughs> you know, because sometimes, sometimes, you know, again, your family members don't always tell you what they do. <laughs> yes, that's, uh, <laughs> that's I can relate really... to that. Let's say I have my Bitcoin on an exchange and later on this exchange collapse. Do I have the legal ground to sue the exchange to get back my money or no? Opened into question because we all sign these wonderful terms and conditions <laughs> that are when we eight thousand pages on law. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, so one of the things that I would recommend is that when you click on a terms and condition, even if you don't read it and you say yes, download it, because the version of the download of the terms and conditions that you signed at the time of your um, making the account might be different than the terms and conditions a year later. And so it's important that if you are thinking about taking any lawsuit against um, an exchange or any company, that you have those terms and conditions. I mean, I've been in situations where with DocuSign, um, that when a company goes under, that the um, DocuSign disappears. So if you have not PDF'd your DocuSign contract, to have, um, you know, a copy of it, then you are out of luck. So again, you know, even if you don't want to take the time to read, and they will probably always be written in a way where it benefits the exchange and not you. However, that doesn't mean if there's not fraudulent or other things going on that it wouldn't void the contract. So, um, you know, again, there's a lot of different situations out there. I mean, we saw that with FTX. Do you see any unique legal challenges for Bitcoin and blockchain technology in general, especially in areas where Bitcoin is not deemed as a legal asset or a legit currency for payments? Like, how do you think these laws in these areas will will hinder or, or encourage, in a way, Bitcoin's growth? Whenever you're doing business, you have to think, am I just navigating in the United States or am I navigating outside of the um, the United States, if you happen to be in the United States, because again, you have listeners who are in other countries as well. So I'm, you know, talking from the United States perspective. But for example, if it, you're in the EU, there are different laws that um, different requirements for disclosures and things like that, because they want to protect their citizens. When you're, if you're in South America or Africa or the continents, um, Australia is very pro, you know, digital assets. So depending upon where you are, um, you do have to do, which is why the Blockchain Legal Institute was created, because it's it's a centralized library for a lot of the resources that we're talking about, because I do have their information listed from around the world, both the United States, as well as other countries. And there's contributors from different places that are updating, you know, the information there. There's always going to be friction sometimes between those that want to do good and those that are in business and those that are in policy because of, um, I'll say it, the greed that happens, you know, around the world. Sometimes money, money talks, money walks. And so, um, you know, when the, the situation with Ukraine happened, there was a lot of of Bitcoin and support that went to help. And when the traditional financial structures were not in place, people were supported through, um, you know, Bitcoin. And, um, but at the flip side, we have to think about not just the unbanked, we have to think about the lack of internet capability in different countries. So it's really great to have an online currency, but if you don't have access to the online portal to be able to access it, then you still have to have a physical currency. And so, you know, again, it goes back to the barter, you know, I'll exchange this with this, you know. So that's why the idea of what money is has evolved over time. We're very comfortable in the electronic age right now, but when a blackout, however forbid, a blackout happens, 
if we have an online wallet, we have no access to any of our funds. So, I mean, again, we have to think, okay, how do we do hybrid? And so, you know, as proactive as I am for Bitcoin, because I think that it is a solution to a problem, I think we also have to think about how do we help those in communities that don't have the, the access? Because with the access, then comes the ability to take another step. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of different areas that we still have to solve. Sometimes we see here and there where people broadcast on um lawsuits and they're saying oh like in shanghai for example they now have deemed bitcoin as an asset like what does it mean when a case like this come out and bitcoin is deemed as a legit asset or deemed as a legit currency what does it mean for bitcoin and i'm i'm guessing that these cases will later on be be referenced be referred in different cases as a positive ground but what what is the real implication here Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I like seeing the different views from the different countries, um, especially when they are helping with the definition, uh, because it, people don't always understand what an asset is. And there's, so these, when someone else outside of the United States, helps with the definition, especially if it's in a financial community that has um, a reputation for being a thought leader in um, the fintech area, then that means that, like you said, that that decision can be referenced and it can be it can be like a door opener, you know, to help with um, those that are maybe not true believers, but want to support because there are always going to be those advocates that are totally in support. There are going to be advocates that are not in support and the middle ground. So, you know, it's those middle ground that, you know, might be scared to show the full support, but they can now say, well, it's like this over here. So I think that this is okay if we craft it like this, because now we can do it here. So, you know, it's, it's the, it's the slow and steady way of, um, and we really have to think globally because Bitcoin is not just in one country. And so it really is important to be able to look at this. Now, what's the overlay of all this is the political regimes. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing Bitcoin being adopted on the nation state level as well. And this effort is led by Samsung Mo and the Gen 3 on a global scale. And for example, El Salvador has adapted Bitcoin as legal tender and places like Madeira in Portugal and Prosperas in Honduras has adopted and and Lugano in Switzerland has adopted Bitcoin as de facto legal tender. So can you tell us what's the difference between the two? What is legal tender and what is de facto legal tender for Bitcoin? There's different layers here. You know, the government makes a statement and says, okay, this is going to be our currency. Then you have to think, okay, how do we, one, give access to wallets for our population like El Salvador did. So that was great. So that way then there could be a transition over to using it. Mm -hmm. And there, but there still has to be education about the fact that, um, what it is, how to use it, um, not to be afraid of it. And the fact that, um, you can exchange, you know, the Bitcoin, just like you would exchange any other currency for product or service. So, um, so there's that part of the development of a currency and having the population. And then you have, the world financial markets accept the fact that you are now using this. So if you are, you know, integrating or doing things with the World Bank or any of the other organizations around the world, um, they then have to think, okay, if I want to assist you and you're only using Bitcoin and I want to give you a loan, how do I do that? Because now I have to I can give it to you in a certain currency, but it's going to have to be converted. Mm -hmm. But really, that's no different than if I go travel over 
to another country and I take my dollar and I exchange it into the currency of that other country, you know? So, um, it's really no different than that because all I'm doing is taking a one-to-one -one coin or currency and exchanging it. So, um, but again, for those that are using an online currency like Bitcoin, people still have to then have a wallet to be able to do that exchange. So that's a step that globally we have to think about um, when people travel to a country. Um, they would then need to download the app. They would need to then move money from whatever their bank over so that way they can then spend it in that country. So those are all things that have to be kind of um, taken into consideration. And, and sometimes there's a little friction because there's always a growth, you know, whenever you're changing things over, there's always challenges, you know, to how do you think through these business problems? But um, eventually it smooths itself out because there's enough options that people have that they realize, oh, it's not that difficult. I mean, like with PayPal and Venmo, you know, there's so many different, you know, um, other apps that also can support. Yeah, it's we're so new in this, and for even for institutional level adoption, and then go go up to like nation state Bitcoin adoption, it's such a big topic, and there's so many moving parts. And then I guess even on an individual level, we know from various cases, it's never easy to deal with the officials. It's never super if it's never it's rarely super efficient for us to do something with them and it doesn't involve a wait time so there's a million moving parts and for a country or a state to adopt bitcoin it's incredibly complicated with the regulatory framework behind it with the financial framework behind it the technology side of it and how to get everybody on board with this with the concept of bitcoin in general it takes incredible amount of convincing and conviction and uh, resources to make it happen. Um, so I'm hoping that the, the first few ones are going to be the hardest to play the role of try and error and really hammer down the, the best framework uh, and, and the path for, for other countries to follow. And then later on, well, we'll see more countries jumping on board, um, e more easily. So I'm definitely super looking forward to that. And I'm sure you're working on the front line of making it happen. So personally, you've been in Bitcoin for four, uh, five, six years. What, what is Bitcoin to you? Um, the, the word that popped right into my mind when you asked me that is freedom. You know, it's freedom of choice, freedom of speech, um, freedom to decide your path um, with options. And, um, you know, I am, I've i invested in Bitcoin over the years and it's gone up to 60,000, gone down to 20, gone up to, you know, 30, goes up and down. But to me, it's like real estate. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a currency, it's a product, it's something that um, you... For me personally, because again, this is not investment advice, but I invest in it with the idea that um, it will provide both the ability to have income as well as options, um, both short term and long term. So, you know, sometimes I decide that I really don't want to sell my Bitcoin because I want to hold on to it. But I sometimes think, OK, well, I want to contribute to the economy. So I need to be able to use it because the more that I use it, then the more that people will also see that it is in circulation. And that's what a currency is. It's in circulation. I don't have the same view about the dollar. I don't have the same attachment to the dollar, but I do have an attachment to Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin Cinderella. I have a copy here in my hands. This is the, I know. This is the Bitcoin so Cinderella <laughs> and seven, seven dwarfs. And this is when Cinderella is, is, uh, has married to her prince. And the story is the story around their effort to build an equal friendly energy sufficient castle powered by solar and heated by Bitcoin mining. And this is a world, yeah. this is a world where the Snow White lives in El Salvador. So this is like the spoiler <laughs> alert here. Um, and it's, it's not the first release. This is the second, this is the second in the series. So can can you tell us more about this uh, yeah. story, Siri? 
The the first one is called the Bitcoin Cinderella, and um, each fairy tale, like the second one, is the Snow White fairy tale. This is actually the Cinderella fairy tale. Um, the next one is going to be the Bitcoin Cinderella and the Pink Sands Treasure of Bermuda, and then I'm also doing a book, which you know you'll be in. It's the Bitcoin Cinderella <laughs> and the True Stories of Women in Bitcoin. Um, so, but. The first story is when um, I took a little bit of literary license and the Cinderella, in the original Cinderella story, the mom dies. In this one, Cinderella's mom is actually a blockchain engineer who worked with Satoshi on Bitcoin. And I have her going back out into the metaverse on a different quest. And so Cinderella is traveling um, like Harry Potter on the blockchain. She's traveling around the world trying to find her mom. And the mom is dropping clues. And as she's um, traveling around the world, she's learning more about um, the magic that exists on the blockchain, which includes Bitcoin. So um, it's a fun read. It's for adults who want to read aloud to their children. And then there are QR codes that bring you back into, you know, various online portals. Um, But it's that, you know, again, we exist in the in real life physical world, but we also li- exist in the online side. And so the books are to help um, those that might have some knowledge or may want want to know to um, kind of not be so afraid of taking that first step. Mm-hmm, I see. And you just mentioned the books, the stories are for adults who are looking to learn more about Bitcoin blockchain along with their children. And how do you believe storytelling in general and fiction can contribute to educating people about Bitcoin and blockchain? I am fascinated with storytelling because I think, you know, um, Joseph Campbell, you know, uh, was always talking about how you can learn so much through storytelling in terms of both um, ethics, morality, as well as, you know, other life lessons. And um, I, I love the idea that you can take a fun read and integrate a tech side into it. And, um, I mean, that's what science fiction is all about when you Mm -hmm. watch the movies. So, and yet, you know, when you think about science fiction, some of what is, we think was sci-fi is now real. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you look at, you know, movies from, you know, a generation or two ago and, you know, it's like, it's the, the technology catches up with, but it probably was already in development. It's just that people weren't able to think and accept it at that time. They thought it was too far out. So um, the fairy tales kind of make it more acceptable for sometimes people to accept some of the things that are already in reality. Um, and it it also answers questions. The memes that we usually see on, on Bitcoin Twitter, the for example, the matrix, and it's reg- yeah. regularly re- referred by Bitcoiners. And we refer our own world these days as, as a matrix and you take the orange pill and then you get to see things very, very differently. So it's all true. It's all very interconnected with our own life. And I find people, so what, if we talk about our real life, then it can get serious too fast, too soon. Um, can get serious yeah. and can trigger anxiety. But then if we put the storyline in the fictional timeline, in a fictional world, it's, it's kind of like this world is parallel to us. So we get to disassociate us a little bit just to see things a little bit clearly, more clearly. And this is what we've been seeing with Matrix. And there's so many powerful metaphors that we can draw reference from, like the pills, um, the, the, how how um, you have all the NPCs around you and you need to decide you want to be a real player. And those are very em- empowering ideas that can link to Bitcoin and later help us gain the conviction, excitement around this technology and how it's connected to our lives. Everyone loved the Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Everyone loved, you know, Harry Potter. Everyone likes, but there are so many messages, like you said, that are built within these stories that are both... Um, about ethics, about politics, you name it. And I also thought it was really important to write these books because 
this information might not yet be taught in schools, but if someone picks up a book um, or discovers it, then all of a sudden it opens up a whole nother area that they did not even think about or know about. And so, you know, it's like you said, the sometimes the tech starts on the geek side and it doesn't roll down to the family side. So this is a way that um, everyday families who come across the book can say, oh, what's this, a Cinderella book, you know, um, or I'm visualizing a movie at some point, you know, well, what is Bitcoin really? Oh, oh, really? This is what it is? Well, let me go to that QR code and learn a little bit more about it. You know, so it's that that first step that happens. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping with the book series that it, like I said, it allows people to open up their eyes and just um, enjoy the ride. Yeah, and this uh, Bitcoin Cinderella and the Seven Dwarfs in this book is very heavily focused on Bitcoin mining, and you're also oh, a, yeah. yeah, and you're also a Bitcoin miner. So I'm sure there's where a lot of the insights of this book are coming from. I have this, and this is very stereotypical of me. Um, I didn't get into mining because I thought it's I'm not technical. And for this very reason, I feel like I almost missed out on on Bitcoin, uh, and I'm glad to have stumbled upon it um, early enough, I would say. Um, but Bitcoin mining, I don't know. Do you have to be technical to get into mining? I'm not. Where mining started and where it is now is totally different. I decided to affiliate myself with a company that would host the machine and um, that also was connected to a pool. So that way, um, basically all I did was buy the machine and pay for the hosting. Um, you still have to be careful with that because again, there are, you know, um, companies that might, um, go out of business. So you have to do your research if you're doing that. I, you know, I have thought about having the machine in my house cause I have solar. Um, but I was concerned that I wouldn't know if something wasn't connecting right like sometimes my node goes down um i wasn't sure if i would know who to call and how to fix it so it's always nice to um to have someone else um who has the expertise knowing what you know today if you were to set up your mining again um how would you would you have done it differently or would you have done exactly the same i probably would have gotten into it earlier but i know i got into it the, at the time that was right for me also the the challenge that we have right now is the having is about to happen so that changes the dynamic of bitcoin mining for those that aren't in it yet um it might not make it as profitable for them um so so that's the other you know, factor that has to be taken into account. How do we stay close to your work? For everyone who is listening, um, definitely visit Blockchain Legal Institute, which is www.bli.tools. And there's a Bitcoin vertical within BLI that's being developed. Um, so I want to make sure that they, um, those that come to BLI learn about Bitcoin and have reliable resources. Thanks for sharing. And uh, any final notes you would like to share? Well, I'm just really excited to be on your show. Um, I think you're, you know, you're, you're doing so much for our community by, by having your show and you have such a strong network of, of individuals who are thought leaders. So I'm, I applaud you for what you're doing. So I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Jackie. And uh, thanks a lot for joining today. Uh, I'm sure we're, I'm sure because everything takes time, right? In the legal space. And, and I, I can definitely, from my very, to, very limited law knowledge from my commercial law classes in university, uh, I can definitely tell it's going to be a process, especially on the global scale um, where we see the, the framework start to mature for the better, um, hopefully. Um, it's it's going to take um, a lot more effort coming from people like you to foster the space in a positive way. So I'm excited to see how that will look like for us in the future. Yeah, I, the one last thing I do want to mention is that um, the Blockchain Legal Institute accepts interns. And so if there are any, you know, if there are individuals out there that would like to um, 
support the research, support the Bitcoin vertical that we're developing for information for those that are coming to the library, the centralized library, then definitely reach out. Love to have you intern and uh, be part of the uh, the movement because um, that's what BLI is. It's part of the, the Bitcoin movement and everything else that we're doing. Mm-hmm. All hands on deck, eh? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Jackie. Um, hope you enjoy the show. And uh, if you like this video, please like the video and subscribe. My name is Vivian Chain, and we'll see you in the next episode.